Okay, we're back with part two. I'm gonna give it just a few seconds to um, let people get back in the room. Um, yeah, just make sure that it has a chance to get everything set up. I wish I didn't have to do it this way and I'm going to find a solution that allows people to engage, um, to join the room easily and which um, does not delete my videos because it's pretty, the last video that I made before um, where we held space to talk about platonics in particular, I felt was really insightful and um, I'm very disappointed to see that that video is not showing up right now. So anyway, where were we, where were we? Yeah, I've already <laughs> forgotten exactly where Oh, 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 yeah, so on the idea of getting closer to being in a privileged status, like a hyper-privileged status, like, yeah, it's been, when I see, uh, when I see, I'm going to use what they would describe themselves in, not the terms that I would use, but when I see white women, when I see white gay men, when I see black men, and when I see... Honestly, like, I'm, I'm just going to note my observations. These are my observations. If someone wants to speak about their observations and this is their experience, please take up the space to do so. Um, I 100% welcome that. I'm not trying to speak over anyone's experience. But when I look at particularly light-skinned, Asian-identified folks, I see a lot of the same thing. I see a lot of the same thing. What I see is people who are willing, um, people who are, um, one, less likely to problematize something when it shows up, people who are less likely to um, speak out or make trouble when there's already trouble, people who don't show up to rallies, people who don't show up to rallies, there's a consistent, there's consistency there. like. People who don't stay at the rallies, people who do not help to organize the rallies, people who do not help to clean up after the rallies, people who don't ask what work needs to be done after the rally because we feel good, but I know that there's more to be done. Who's asking that question? Um, it's not always who you would expect. And I think that as people get closer to approaching that fullness of privilege, I think they get more willing to throw others under the bus and more willing to you know, make exceptions, you know, just like we'll understand this one thing and, and start exceptionalizing problematic behaviors and problematic language. I do see that. So actually I feel like this article could apply to a lot more people within queer and LGBTQIA spaces. Let's see here. There's so much to think through. There's so much to think through. Yeah, number eight. If you don't identify, here's the thing. Here's, not what, here's what I'm not going to say. Other people might say, if you're not gay, don't say things like this. The thing is, I don't believe in gay, straight. Bi is even very limiting for me. If you think about that for just a second, you understand why bi um, is really violent to my experience as a non-binary person, I'll just make it clear there. Um, I'm not going to say if you're not gay, don't say these things. I'm, what I'm going to say is take, take those connections seriously. If you are experiencing something where you're like, oh, well, we just made out that one time because, you know, it was late or, you know, I was drunk or, you know, I was just like feeling this way. No, no, I don't. I actually don't understand. What I understand is that you made a complex choice and that you have complex feelings and interactions with the people around you. So could we be more accountable for that? Could you know, um, if you felt something, could you be accountable for it? Could you ask more questions about it and see, like, is there a connection that you actually need to look at? Is there something that you're ignoring? Um, that's what I'm going to suggest. I'm not going to suggest that people stop saying girl crush and all of these things. What I'm going to say is take that more seriously. Take your feelings more seriously. Develop crushes on 
fans and women fans around you. <laughs> Fall in love with them. Um, if you're just like, oh, I totally am in love with you and I adore you and I just like, oh, 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 do it. Like actually do that work. Then, you know, don't let it just be when you're at the party or when you're on Instagram. How about you get in some nice DMs and offer some support? That's what I'm going to say. Number nine, girlfriend. So I think this is just, yeah, this seems to be the same thing. I'm reading it to make sure I'm not doing violence of ignoring something. So number nine is girlfriend, which feels related to eight, girl crush, and 10, lesbian lover. Yeah, this is what is annoying to me, is that this feels very much about identity politics rather than a fullness of experience. I feel like when people get into really queer spaces, things get weird. Like things get really weird. You do not understand. Like you, <laughs> you have that, I don't know if it's human or Western or capitalistic desire to be like, tell me what we are, what are we? I need to, I need a, I need to understand exactly what we are. And people won't tell you, not because they don't know, but also because they don't know. They, they really don't know and they don't want to know. I don't want to know. I don't want to know what we are. I want to know that we're honest. I want to know that we um, are connected and vulnerable and doing the work of falling in love with each other and that sometimes it's not always work and we just enjoy it and we're building together. That's what I'm into. I'm not interested in um, categorizing which type of sexual being I am, which type of um, intimate being I am. I'm not really interested in that. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna say for eight, nine, and 10, this feels like I'm in like an English class being like, so let's do exercises eight, nine, no. <laughs> I'm just reading that to make sure I'm not missing anything that I can immediately see. For eight, nine, and 10, stop doing this homophobic nonsense is what I'm gonna say. The song about I kissed a girl and I liked it needs to be about not I experimented one and you know, now I'm that girl, I'm that cute girl. No, it needs to be I kissed a girl and I deconstructed that. So actually I understand that I'm a complex individual and I just allowed my experience to be fulfilling and it was. Can we get there? Can we do that together? Can we create that culture? I believe that we can, I believe that we must. If we want to see radical change, we need to start loving each other radically. So don't bring in basic nonsense. Stop doing eight, nine, and 10 till you mean it or say it so that you mean it, one of the two. Number 11, partner. I am gonna read this one again. See, I tricked you, I said I wasn't gonna read everything. It's because I tricked myself, I wasn't sure. Um, number 11, partner. I'm really not sure why straight couples refer to each other as partners. You have boyfriend, girlfriend, problematic AF. That's extremely exclusive to me and many other people. Boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse. This is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. Wife, husband, and fiance. This is what I'm saying. And they wrote fiance and they also didn't understand that Fiance in a traditional gendered sense has two forms, one being for um, masculine perceived and one for feminine perceived. But anyway, this is what I'm saying. It's a limited understanding of there's a boyfriend and girlfriend. That's problematic. That's like really exclusive for me. When you say, sorry, I'm gay. Or, yeah, when you say, sorry, I'm gay, when you say, or you're like, yeah, I'm gay, I'm into you. When you say, sorry, I'm straight, when you say um, any of this, you are choosing not to see me as a whole person because I've already explained this concept a thousand times. Almost everywhere that I write something, I write it. Almost everywhere that I share my thoughts, I'm sharing that first and foremost because I want it to be understood. So there's actually no excuse. When you say boyfriend and girlfriend, it's not something that can apply to my body, which means that you don't want to legitimately see me um, as a legitimate experience, as a legitimate person. Um, I stand by that also. And then the second thing that they mention here is spouse, wife, husband, fiance, fiance. 
And I feel like there, again, we see this focus on, I hope that some of you can see the lines that I'm seeing, and because I, I don't know how to explain them, but what I do see in LGBT spaces is an extreme focus. I think most people feel like they won. They won the big struggle. What was the big struggle? Marriage equality. What does that even mean? Marriage equality. Might as well say marriage sameness because that's really what it seems like you want a lot of the time. That's what a lot of people are asking for, marriage sameness. I want to inherit the same piece of paper. I want to inherit the same ideologies. I want to inherit the same violences. I want to talk to my... Um, I'm going to use partner. I'm going to talk to my, my spouse as in the same violent and heteronormative ways that I've inherited and that I aspire to in the United States and in many other places. We won. We got it. We got the right to participate in that. First of all, you didn't. You didn't. If you look at it, it's actually more complex. This is not to diminish anyone's historical work. I know many people have devoted their life to um, that form of political representation or opportunity that's how i would say that but um the majority of people think that you won and are speaking over um, trans experience are speaking over non-binary experience over asexual aromantic experience um, the complexities of that over intersex experience when are you bringing these conversations in because i don't really feel like we won um i also don't know what there is to win um, we just want to be seen as whole people. Uh, seems a little bit more simple. I'm going to go on because I'm <laughs> getting frustrated with that. Um, let's see. Let's see. So, so it's talking about these terms, boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, wife, husband, fiance, fiance. And you've had those terms forever. Are you trying to be gender ambiguous when you use partner? I mean, that sounds like a dope strategy, honestly. Be ambiguous, confuse people. But I also understand that it may not be appropriate. <laughs> Are you using partner because you think it's trendy? I just don't understand. I hear straight, married, or engaged couples use partner, and I'm just like, why though? Queer people have had to use partner to refer to significant others because we couldn't legally get married until 2014 in America. No, also that feels, yeah, I'm just going to call that out. That feels annoying and limited because I've had to use, they don't have to use any language. And I actually, I feel like as resilient as, as resilient and creative and innovative as queer communities have been historically, always, always as far as I can see, have been the people pushing every part of the, the margins. First of all, I feel like a lot of people are saying things like wife, wifey, creating new terms, zaddy, all the time. We're not had to use partner. We're not had to use partner. It's a, this feels like it's about territory wars. It feels like it's about identity politics and how who gets to um, own the space, who wins it. That's tiresome. It's tiresome. I'm, I'm, I'm very much not behind this reading this reading that I'm doing of this particular section. Also, for those of you watching, I have included the link to the article um, in the description. So if you're watching along, please read along. Um, you can see some of the language that I'm looking about or looking at. I read your comment, Tracy, and it confused my brain for a second. Um, how do I feel about lover? How do I feel about lover? I feel like it just has sleazy connotations, but I'm not against it. <laughs> I'm not against it because I feel like part of me understanding it as sleazy is the fact that I haven't reclaimed um, some parts of my um, sexual experience and understanding my and others' sexuality as a constructive, healing, reclaimed process. I don't think that I have um, fully done that work because I can still feel that I have these negative responses. Um, or hyper positive responses, either one. I can't evaluate it in a personal and meaningful way um, as I want to. Lover, lover, lover. I would like to live in a world where I can call someone that I just meet my lover and for that to literally mean 
that I'm doing the practice of love, that I'm doing the practice of care, that I'm honestly engaged with the concept of what it means to be loving this person. I would really love that. I would, um, I think that sounds really nice. So I don't personally use that term, but it's just because I haven't worked through my prejudices yet. And I will probably be really annoying and reclaim that very soon and then be using it and having people say that they're confused all the time. So I'm looking forward to that. And if you have other questions, again, I'm going to affirm that I'm willing to answer some like Google worthy. You could just answer it in 30 second kind of questions because um, I probably will not interpret things the way that the majority of people in the world are going to. So if you'd like to hear my particular thoughts on something, please share your question below. Um, you can also message it to me and I will not read your name. I will not shame you. Um, yeah, and we're going to get into some real depths. We're going to take up probably the full uh, two hours here. So we've got about, let me do my maths, 44 minutes. Is that what we looking at? 44 minutes left. Um, and we're going to talk through, after we move through this article, I'm going to just open the space for some questions that people ask more generally in private messages and in comments. And we'll look at that. So, yeah, partner, I'm not agreeing with this. Um, if I'm understanding their intentions, and I've read through a majority of this article now, and I feel like I'm understanding this places that they're speaking from, I think their privileges are aligning in a way that skews um, the analysis. And not that my analysis is the only valid one. What I'm saying is the one that they presented has a number of problems. And I definitely feel that using partner as a gender ambiguous, like, Ambiguifying. Do we have a word for that already said? I can make one. I don't want to. But um, using that as a strategy for gender ambiguity, I think, is solid. And I think um, I remember using that strategy when I was younger, when I used the word friend. I would use it for everyone because I didn't want to have to respond to the level of intimacy and the, the genders and the perceived genders and my sexual relationship and my physical relationship and my, I didn't want to do all the work of responding to that every time. So I'd use friends and I feel like it was a super queer strategy of not responding to systemic pressures. Um, I feel like I use partner in a very similar sense and I'm hoping that literally everyone I engage with can be a partner to me so much that it becomes um, boring to say it, that literally everyone right now, what it means is someone who's deeply investing in me and my dreams and doing that work with me and who I obviously, whom I've deeply invested in too. Ideally, I would love for that to be the whole world um, because I feel like we should be investing in each other in meaningful ways all the time, but currently that's not the case. Um, okay. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Yeah, so again, what I noted, so this person goes on and says, we didn't have a way to refer to significant others who we lived with or were committed to since we couldn't get married and thus partner. That's uncreative. That's a, it's false. That's not very queer, it really is, honestly. Queer people, I feel like they're saying queer people like LGBT. I think they would think that they're synonymous. Um, we didn't have a way to refer to, no, this is literally not the case. I, I literally study language both academically and personally. It is my love and what I have found endlessly over and over and over is that there is never just one way to say anything. And when someone suggests, oh, this language doesn't have a word for this, or this one has 3,000 words for this, it's really not as interesting as it sounds. Um, minimally, it's inaccurate. And more maximally, at the other side, it's extremely violent. And it's extremely violent, I feel, to say we didn't have a way to refer to anything. That's never been the case. If you look right now, you'll find a um, list of terms and like, what are they called? Not Wikipedia, but like similar things with people sharing hundreds of terms, terms that I've never even heard of because 
people are creating out of necessity. So if you're saying there was a situation of necessity, people were creating that language. Queer folks, deeply queer folks, were creating that language. You're welcome. Um, secondly, people were creating beyond necessity because they were dreaming. They weren't just thinking of what they needed in the moment. They were also thinking of where they were going. So actually, I don't feel any of that is um, accurate. Um, OK, number 12, we're at the end of this list here. Queer and queering. I feel like I'm about to send this article back to the person who wrote it. So it says, you don't get to use queer as an identity or a verb. You aren't queer in your relationship by going to a play party or exploring polyamory. You are and you aren't. I would say you are and you aren't. I, if I was talking to the person this person's talking to, what a confusing sentence. <laughs> if I were talking to the person that this person is addressing, I would probably also say that they weren't. But I would also affirm some ways that they are. It's complex. It's not an identity. It's a process. You don't get to say that's so queer about anything. Yeah, I'm just gonna, not even going to respond to that. Yet again, queer is a very real identity, and it's also a reclaimed word that has been used against LGBTQ people. Uh, um, honestly, I want to look up this author because I want to respect their experience, and I want to know more about um what they identify with and what kind of ideological histories they're bringing in but i feel yeah this is what i expected one second i thought this article was going to be on and popping because everybody's talking about it but hmm. And it tells you how much we need to have these conversations or somebody needs to. Karen. Teen Vogue, also, I just saw a link to that. Teen Vogue has been killing it. I don't even know who's on that team. I've seen three things from Teen Vogue about queerness or something like, what is it about um, the need to investigate blackface through using GIFs and other media? That's a, like, <laughs> Teen Vogue is doing the work, and I don't understand why they're the ones doing it when, like, other people keep trying, and it's nasty, and it's disappointing, and it's whatever. Teen Vogue is doing it. I have seen stuff. I can find something to deconstruct with most everything. Teen Vogue has been killing it. I have had no complaints with the work that they've been um, sharing. So if you want to know what I endorse... Um, Teen Vogue, yeah, is killing it. Corinne, Corinne, Corinne. Um, okay, I'm going to speak on this because kill, killing it with feminism as well. Yeah, they have because I feel like... Oh, did, <laughs> did you... Uh, <laughs> they have been killing it because I feel like they're not looking at feminism as a um, an identity word. They're not looking at any of this as an identity word. They're asking, what is what does it do? Because you can't, I don't even know how to get into this. Maybe I'll look at um, the article on blackface through GIFs. You, you, nobody tells you to look at that. No, there's no, like, there's no identity politics to tell them why that was necessary to look at right now in 2017. It is 2017, wait, let me make sure. Pisces, I have no idea where I am in time or space. But um, yeah, they have been killing it because they're looking at it as a process of undoing and of doing. They're asking what work, what does something accomplish? What does it do? And that question will do far more. If I offer anything before I transition out of this lifetime, I want people to stop asking what is, you know, stop using the verb be and ask about what. What does do? What does do um, offer in terms of understanding? It's almost always more promising and more revealing. Avi, did you say you, you did the very same thing looking at the author? 
I feel like a lot of people police me for doing that and say like it doesn't matter the me it's about the message it's not about the messenger it's not the case it's not the case the thing is you cannot be a neutral messenger the way that we talk about journalism and reporting things you don't report things neutrally and I think it's really violent that in academic spaces in the West and um, these educated spaces were taught that it's ideal at a French teacher in particular was like, this is our best accomplishment, reporting things neutrally and being able to represent others' arguments um, and doing that consistently. I don't really feel like that. When I look at other queer black femmes around me, we get others' arguments. We don't need to share them endlessly. Um, what we need is to take up space with other narratives, with other potentials, with other possibilities. So I feel like it is important for me to understand what identity someone is embodying because there's no such thing as neutral reporting. We bring in so much in our experience and I do want to know, um, I wanna know how much accountability this person has to have for sharing uh, these types of thoughts. And right now, looking at them and looking, I was already there, noticed that, noticed that I was already there before um, looking at their LinkedIn and, and looking at that some, not just pictures, but looking at the things that they're sharing too. Um, they look to me like the white liberal LGBT folks that I know from UNC. Um, this is not everybody. Some of y'all are dope. Some of y'all are doing incredible deconstructive work. But some of y'all are really not. Some of you are really, truly not. Some of you are really not doing that work, and it shows. Um, yeah, I'm not going to read anybody on here, but um, yeah, I do have. I have a lot of concerns. I had a lot of concerns opening this article about who it's speaking from. Uh, that's such an interesting construction. I think you know what I mean. Um, and who it's being who it's being written for. And I feel like yeah, 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 yeah. Go even it's, look in this article. So articles are not just writing, right? You have you have um, the the main text that someone's sharing. You have the um, the actual branding of the, like who it's, who's publishing it, how do they describe themselves? This website describes itself as the cultural roadmap for city girls everywhere. That's pretty hard for me to identify with. That's pretty hard for me to identify with. And I do not know that anyone who um, deeply and immediately and non-problematically or non-reflectively identify with that. I don't know that what I would take away from their um, insights. I would have a lot of questions. But there's that. Then there is the choice of media that they chose to include. If you don't understand what the point of um, the images is, or you think, oh, you know, well, just, they just picked images. No, there are, <laughs> there are billions there are billions of images that this person could choose. They chose, it appears to be five images to share within this article. Let me count to make sure. They chose five. So what this person chose, this is something that linguistics has taught me in a lot of ways. Out of billions of choices, they felt that these five pictures um, most suitably represented what they were trying to communicate, what they saw as most important. In other words, the things that they put in the images are what they saw as most ideal for, not ideal as like the ideal representation, but ideal to talk about, the most worthy of taking up space. So the first image is um, described as two women holding hands. One of them appears to have darker skin. Um, melanin. Um, I don't really know what that's doing. Like, can I also, could I also be in that image where my body is um, 
could someone also perceive, if I were holding hands with someone who was described as a woman, could I also be perceived as queer or does it have to be two people who look like traditionally feminine? I don't know, um, but this author seems to have decided. Second image is, I don't even know this. Um, this person does acting, but I don't know their name anyway. Just sort of this like edgy, white, androgynous look. The next image, is this Ellen Page? Saying, I am here today because I'm gay. Yeah, I'm not even gonna go there. Um, the next image is Katy Perry saying, I kissed a girl and I liked it. And then the next image is someone saying, lesbian lover. They look like they're in a medical setting. All I see here, other than the first image, which doesn't even feature someone's face, is white representation. Um, I see white representation in a very binary way. There's nobody on this list who looks, um, for the majority of the population, confusing. Like, like I'm totally like, wow, you really, just by existing visually, you're confusing my concept of gender. Um, it's a pretty non, it's a pretty binary space. And that's really frustrating for me. I keep bringing this up. It's really frustrating for me because if you understand, this is, this is probably one of the latest articles to come out right now talking about LGBTQ. Again, that's not a word I identify with or a phrase, but this is one of the latest things to come out that people are talking about right now regarding these questions. And the article that most people are talking about regarding these questions does not represent me, does not acknowledge the complexities of my existence or even seemingly attempt to. And I will not say like, people will be like, oh, well, you know, it's hard. You only have this much space. You only have this, these many words. If you only have these many words, do it in images. If you only have these many words, do it on a different website. If you only have these many words, write a second article and make sure that it's more popular. Make sure that people have access to it in some way. If you only have these many words, maybe don't. Maybe choose to have more words. Maybe ask for more. Um, maybe give up some of the space that's being taken up by these um, binary perceived people here talking in very traditionally LGBT. I don't know whether to include the T in this. I've seen problematic stuff, but um, less so. Like I'm not, I'm not any of these images. I'm not any of these images. So like, do I exist or is it is this just a journal? Because if this is a journal that this person is writing, then that makes sense. Maybe they only want to speak to um, things that benefit them. That's what I'm saying. That's why it's important for me to investigate who's sharing this message and not understand, not thinking that there's a neutral reporter or, or journalist who's just gonna, you know, just report the facts. Because when you report the facts, you include imagery that deletes my existence. Um, how these violences are played out on my body. That's what I suspected when I opened this article and that's what I'm finding still. And it's very tiresome. It's very tiresome that for the majority of people who engage this article, that's what they're gonna take away. It's something that still, despite the amount of space that it's taking up, has failed to respond adequately to. Um, it's like I'm in a waiting line. And I've heard people even say things like that, like, you know, they just, they can't do it all at once. Like, you got to start at the top and do it. So you're affirming that, like, literally, I have to wait. I have to wait to be seen as a full person. Like, you're going to get your privileges. You're going to get your privileges. You're going to get your social and structural affirmation. And I'll continue to support you and exist. Um, no, first of all, that's unreal reasonable that's not that's nonsense but secondly it's also not what happens when people get the privilege that they've been desiring they actually um, seem to forget uh, who else has been engaged in that struggle so 
I'm going to go ahead and pause on this article. I'm going to open the space up for further questions about gender, sexuality, language um, that people may have. I am going to go to the full hour. Um, even if that's just me sitting here eating pineapple, I will definitely do that on cam. Um, I'm going to look at my messages. This is strange. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm going to take this space literally to just um, respond to questions that people may have about gender, language, sexuality. Ask something. If you're afraid to ask it, ask it in private. We should be accountable for our words and ideologies. We should not be so eager to remove our identities from the things and the work and the questions that we're um, putting out into the world, but I welcome you to do that if you really don't feel um, safe sharing. And I think I also have a couple of questions in my private messages already, so I'm going to respond to those. But first, I'm going to take a second to breathe and um, just take about a minute to relax a second. Hmm. Also, if anyone didn't see my last live show or broadcast or space, whatever, um, I'm hoping to reclaim it. I really want to get it back from Facebook servers, wherever it went. But either way, if you didn't see the last one, kind of the point was stop calling me a friend. <laughs> And it's not personal. Um, the point is it's not personal. The point is it's very political to me. And um, I was deconstructing some of the ways that friendship and platonics have been really violent in my experience. And I will be putting those um, thoughts again, some of the things that came up in the discussion, into videos. That will be on the Intuit Hue page. Um, also, please follow that. Like, subscribe there. It's really helpful to me. And to you, I've, I feel like we're doing a lot of different things that can um, serve for a lot of healing. But basically, I was talking about platonics and friendship. And the short thing is, don't call me a friend because I'm trying to be much more than that. And because friend has historically meant um, exploiting my body and resources without investing in me. It's, that's what it evokes for me. And also, I feel politically that we are limiting ourselves by calling each other friends um, in general. So I want something more intimate and more dreamy. Friend, Avi, friend. I'll write it down here. A little bit stuffed up. Um, yeah, I'm not anyone's friend. I'm not trying to be anyone's friend. I will not respond to friend, um, but I will respond to um, someone who's investing in you, as someone who's caring about you, who's loving you, who's trying to learn how to love you better, who is um, interested in your experiences, who will stay up on the phone with you at 2 a.m. That's who I am. I, I'm not your friend, and I don't intend to be. I'm going to do a much better job than friends could. I don't know which one I want more, pineapple or this orange juice. I just want to show this shirt off again. I love this shirt so much. All right. Um, if no one is ready to post yet, we do have about 20 more minutes. I'm going to jump in my private messages and read um, some of the thoughts that came up there. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, that was just a general question, and okay, let's see. So someone, when they sent this to me, said, um, I was reading this article, number seven made me think, 
Let's see. Let me read this and reprocess it. Let me go to number seven, I'm not understanding immediately. I may have already spoken to this, so I might speak a little bit more on it. Um, yeah, I did already speak to this song. This person is basically asking about number seven and about people who don't identify as gender fluid. This person aren't gender fluid, so I'm, I think there's some nuance that I might be missing there. Um, choosing to use they, them for themselves. And also about the idea of always using they, them for others. Um, unless asked to use a different pronoun. And then talked about some of their work where they've been using this idea of using they, them. There's, um, and yeah, that was a paintbrush. I don't know why I picked that up. <laughs> um, and then people asking to use a gender conforming pronoun. I've never heard gender conforming. That's such an interesting phrase. Hmm. Um, welcome, welcome. I, yeah, I've missed a lot of people coming in and out, but um, again, feel free to post questions because that's what's going to keep this going and use this space for the um, fullness that I'm hoping it, it, it has. So yeah, I, again, just to share what I already mentioned, I think that people using they, them because they don't care, because like it's literally just that sentiment, like, oh, I don't care. I don't care what people call me. I really do care. I really do care because people are very willing to put specific ideologies on my body and specific names and refuse to use other names and ideologies. Um, so I do kind of care. I, I care a lot. I care in my whole existence. So hearing someone say, like, just whatever is fine, I don't care, is, an ex is extremely um, likely that that's a show of privilege. And um, I could see it as a form of allyship. I've never seen anyone who deconstructed their politics enough to say something like that without identifying with it and say it was for allyship. Um, it's not what I've seen. I do use they, them for everyone except for one individual um, that I meet, that I've already met. Um, and I, if someone asks to use a gender conforming pronoun, then I'm very interested in um, finding out in what ways they're accountable to that. Um, I use all forms of my language quite intentionally. And where I'm not using it intentionally, I'll acknowledge that. And if I notice later, I'll acknowledge it and I'm willing to do the work and I'm willing to help others heal from things that have caused hurt. So I'm very much accountable for the choices that I'm making with my language and the things that I'm putting out into the world. But when someone casually from UNC Chapel Hill, because they're in a liberal space and they feel like, you know, I'm, I just want to be perceived as free and, you know, I'm, I want to be cute and I want to be this and this is edgy and they say that they're gender fluid, and then in class someone misgenders me and they don't correct them. No, I am gonna police that. I am going to police that in the sense of, I don't wanna identify myself with the police. I am going to hold that accountable, and I'm gonna ask for a future accountability, and I'm gonna ask, you know, in what ways does your body not require you to be accountable? Because if it doesn't require you to, you're most likely not gonna be. Um, the majority of people doing this work are doing it, um, I won't say just because we have to, but at least that's where a lot of it starts, <laughs> is a feeling like we um, want to ask more questions to have more potential for truths. I'm going to share something here because I don't see any questions. 
Um, so one thing I want to share about my experience of identifying as non-binary, agender, femme, queer, um, using laden pronouns, and somewhat identifying as trans, is that it was boring. It was really mundane. It was not in my experience that I went through years of agony, of feeling like I hated my body, of feeling like um, like I was born in the wrong body. I, I, I'm, I am not speaking against anyone who identifies with that experience. What I'm saying is that is not the whole experience. That is not the only potential experience. And for me, my experience was quite mundane. Actually, what it was was, you know, I would like to have the option to wear looser pants. I would like the option to be able to wear lipstick. I would like to be cute. It looks really um, dark. It looks really sad. I don't know. Because I live as an animal who wants to express something more complex in the fullness of my experience. Um, and what I found was every time I would want to do something, people would make assumptions about, people would meet me and before they even, this is truly absurd, before they even meet me, this is happening to a lot of you too. The majority of you are living this experience right now. When you meet someone, they are automatically assuming, automatically assuming. they. When you meet someone, when you are walking up to someone, they are thinking about what's in your underwear. That's what's absurd. My gender experience is in no way absurd. What's absurd is that I have to defend how I relate to my genitals. That I have to explain to people um, what they look like, what they, how they function, if they, um, if I've thought about changing them in some way, if I feel like I'm a legitimate trans person, if I had chosen not to change my body down there, up here, anywhere, in any specific way. That's exhausting and it's weird. Um, if you're gonna ask me about my genitals and their function, you know, maybe there's a time and place for that and I'm not close to it. What I'm saying is do not use that to then make assumptions about the sounds that I want to be called by to make assumptions about the types of clothing that I'm going to put on or if I use makeup. Yes, I do. It's ELF. It's the best. It is apparently not tested on non-human animals. Um, making assumptions about the ways that I'm going to speak and the types of emotional labor that I'm going to do in, in a relationship, um, the types, if I could uh, legitimately be interested in them in a number of complex ways, it's exhausting. I would much rather someone just ask me in what ways I'm existing with them. Um, and it was from that simple understanding that I started to rework my gender. Some people do deeply identify with feeling like their body does not reflect um, their experience internally or their aspirations um, in any sense. Like There are a lot of people who identify with that. There are a lot of people who want actively to participate in surgery, to participate in hormones, to participate in more makeup or less makeup, to participate in changing their hair in a certain way. And that is all um, valid and meaningful. Oh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. I, 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 um, yeah, I try to just hold space for my truths and I find that to be the most admirable thing about any animal that I meet is how much they're willing to just be honest about where they are and where they dream of being. So I'm trying to hold space for that and I hope that that's coming through and, um, yeah, I really appreciate that. But my experience is, is mundane. Um, it was one day that I was going to the pool with a partner and I wanted to put, I think it was, yeah, the reading mat that I now use for Intuit You. I wanted to put that around my head. 
because I liked the way it looked. And what I found was I couldn't, myself, I could not put it on without um, justifying how it was for play. You know, I was treated like a joke or I'm like, you know, I'm going to be like extra, extra. I'm just going to be extra <laughs> in order to affirm that this is not real. And there were, once I noticed that question because I'm annoying, because I don't stop in any one place, when I see a question that really feels unanswered, I'm going to look into it. Um, I love questions. And when I started looking at that, I saw hey, you know, there's something about your experience here that you absolutely have to mock and have to make a joke and have to delegitimize in order to acknowledge it in any way. And that's really not aligned with how you move through the world in general. So I'm quite concerned about you. Um, can we take some time? This is me speaking with myself. Can we take some time to look at these potentials and see if we can open some things up? And I started saying, you know, well, I'm going to put this on. And I'm going to wear it. Um, and I'm going to allow myself to speak in this particular way and be perceived as this or that. And I'm going to allow myself to reconsider what would it be like to experience another set of sounds being associated with my body when someone calls my name. Could I have multiple names? Currently, I do. Um, it's really about allowing ourselves to live in all of our potentials. And I don't mean in this LGBT rainbow centered way of like, we all exist in a spectrum. No, it's really, it's more mundane than that. I really feel that gender is not serving us. Deeply, I feel that. I feel that gender is not serving us. It, it's getting in the way of, for, as a whole, some of us are identifying with gender um, as a mode of re-navigating violence that happened through gender. But what I'm saying is if we could ideally just arrive at a place where there is not gender, not in this way of like, oh, I don't see gender, I don't see, I just see everyone as people. Not that, that's not what I'm saying either. I'm saying if we can accountably look at the violence that has occurred and work ourselves to a place where we can affirm our truths in every moment, without having to first refer to gender and then check if we pass with it, if we align with it, if it's good enough, if it's queer enough, if it's valid, if it's realistic looking. Um, that's what I'm trying to get. That's what I'm trying to get. And I just made that choice very, very boringly in my personal life to stop um, letting people work like that. Like if somebody approaches me right now and they're like, oh, are you, are you gay? I'm going to confuse you on purpose because it's confusing. The things that I feel in myself are, are confusing and complex. They're not confusing when I'm honest about them. But the fact is I've experienced so much violence historically and had so many influences and so much media talking um, at me all the time. And I have traumas from uh, different growing up experiences, you know. It's complex to know our desires. So what I'm going to give you is complex. I'm not going to simplify it for you to understand. I'm going to give you something equally as complex as my experience or the best that I can approximate. And I suggest that we all start doing that. Don't look at my experience as, oh, Amani has like always been queer or this. Like, I'm not being queer, I'm doing queer. And I suggest that you do the same because I, I think if you look at your experience, it's the same thing I said in the last video. I think if you look at your experience, you're legitimately going to find a number of places where you're limited. And a lot of people are doing that work right now. Feminists, as different feminist cultures um, are taking shape and reclaiming shape and moving around, then a lot of them are like, you know, we, we want to see different potentials for women while also affirming this right for a woman to identify in this traditional womany way. Um, there's a lot of points being missed though. <laughs> I want us to find affirmation and strength and resilience through not needing to identify um, so deeply with these words so much that they bind us. 
I want us to feel fulfilled by them, and I want us to feel grateful for them and thankful for them, for the, the, the solidness that they can offer. And then I want us to quickly move away from that and trust ourselves and say, um, I don't need to identify as a demisexual, pan, blah, 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 this and this. I'm not diminishing anyone's experience. Maybe I am. Actually, maybe I am. I need to look at that. But I'm not saying that, like, I don't know that we need that if we can literally, if we can find a place in ourselves to say, I don't want to touch you in a way that I'm perceiving as sexual right now because I don't want to, or because I know that I do and I don't want to, but right now I'm choosing to honor the part where I don't want to. If we can get to a place of being able to say that, then we will have honored the fullness of how we exist. I don't need to describe that I'm demisexual so that someone will treat that as valid. If I tell you that I'm the most sexual person and then for six months, I literally want no physical contact, I don't want to even make eye contact with you, then we need to work that understanding out. I don't need, um, you don't need, let's say it that way, you do not need a label, you do not need an identity to validate my experience. If you cannot see me as a full person because I tell you that I'm a full person, then you have a problem. You have a number of problems that you need to look at, and I have these problems too. So we're all working right now. And I just want us to be honest and truthful, and sometimes it helps and sometimes it gets in the way. Um, I think that's what Becky thinks and Becky says, I don't care about labels. No, exactly, because Becky can say I don't care about labels because Becky doesn't have to because Becky also doesn't care what Becky's wearing for Halloween. Um, and they don't have to think that far ahead because Halloween is one day of the year, one night of the year. And once they have candy or cute pictures or um, the physical contact or the intimacy or the a fun experience or whatever they want. Um, they take the costume off and the next day they are back to it. So Becky doesn't have to and Becky will not until Becky does have to um, because it's a lot more work than um, I would ever do. That's not true. I would do it. <laughs> I would do it anyway. But I would have a lot less inclination to um, in my daily life if I didn't have systems uh, pressuring me to do that just to exist. I'm just reading a question. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I appreciate it. So someone just sent me a comment. I just want to say I appreciate you sharing that. If you want to share a, a specific um, question in that, I would love to respond. I don't want to speak further on that because I don't want to commit violence to your experience. Um, but I am receiving that. I am hearing you. And... Yeah, there's a lot of times this, um, I don't know how much to share. There's a lot of times, I'm not going to contextualize this person's comment, I'm just going to keep speaking. But if you want to share more, I'd love to respond um, here to that. Um, yeah, it's an incredible amount of emotional labor. And I see a lot of people choosing to use language that others will understand more easily, um, that's more comforting for others in their process because we have a lot of, I perceive it as because we have a lot of narratives that others need to be included and, you know, education is always a positive and we just need meaningful dialogue. To me, these are white femme narratives and I, I don't ascribe to them or I'm reworking them. I don't believe that all we need is dialogue and that we just need to talk more. Um, sometimes we talk and it's worse. <laughs> Sometimes we talk and you think that you've understood me and then you commit more violence because I tell you that you haven't understood and you refuse to believe it. Sometimes it's, just, it's complex, it's complex. So I'm not necessarily of the belief that that's um, the most ideal path. Oh, I just had my internet off actually, hold on. 
me turn my wife on, on my phone so I can make sure I see everything. Um, yeah, I think I could just e just as easily be somewhere else um, in my experience, but right now I refuse to work with language that is more accessible uh, because it's too heavy. There's too much that comes with the baggage of using language that others reference. If I tell someone the complexities of how I interact with my gender and my sexuality and I just feel open to experiencing with this, these people and this people, and they're like, oh, so like, are you gay then? And I'm like, so that's not what I said. Um, I gave you a very full response to explain, and they're like, okay, so you're bi? Like, the problem is not the language. The problem is not the tool of language. The problem is that the cultural apparatus that we live in has no space to slow down and hear what the other person is sharing or the other people are sharing. We don't take time to legitimately see the complexities and we want to immediately understand or feel like we understand um, when actually understanding is a multi-layered process. That's it. I'm going to share something just also about language. I don't know how to um, how to put this in words. Yeah, I'll just I'll share this a little bit and then pull it together. So, okay, yeah, I'm going to share a few more thoughts on that then. Um, for example, when people try to count the number of languages in the world, a lot of times they're like there are 6,000 languages in the world. There are 80,000, I don't know, there's just a huge range of numbers that people say. And the main factor that I've seen linguists using traditionally to understand how many languages there are in the world is mutual intelligibility, meaning what they intend is um, how, ex like, when two languages or two communities of languages interact, how easy is it for them to understand each other? Now, almost all linguists that I've looked at have used a binary way of functioning with this. They say, you can't understand or you can't understand. And I feel like when we, when you look at the complexities of language, like Portuguese and Spanish, right? You're like, Someone's like, oh, well, you know, they're so similar. So you actually, like, if you speak Portuguese or Spanish, like, you can understand the other. It's super easy. If I've said that in the past, excuse me, I really apologize. That's truly a violence, and it's misleading. Um, I do not think that I've said that many times, but there was a point in my life where I definitely said something that they will not understand each other, and they will understand each other. Um, for example, let's let's know. I'm just going to explain. I'll relate it back. Don't worry. <laughs> but let's look at like Portuguese. A Portuguese speaker looking at Spanish will understand more automatically than someone looking from Spanish at Portuguese, and that's because of the way that reading is. The one the the types of writing in Spanish are more um, transparent, they're more easy to, they're easier to understand um, because they're more aligned with universal standards or things that are more common in the world in language. But in Portuguese, Portuguese has a number of conventions like with their contractions, how they shorten words or the sounds that are used which are uncommon um, compared to Spanish. And so, right, and so it's, it's harder for a Spanish speaker to understand Portuguese than the other way around. So that's one level. There's no such thing as like, they're, they're not on equal terms of understanding. It's the same way I am in my experience as a black person in the United States. I have a much greater understanding of white cultures and white modes of being and white histories than they have of me. I can understand my language and theirs, and I need to be proficient in both. But the same is not true the other way. So there's that. But then also, like, I don't know, someone will say, oh, oh, English is easy. I understand English. 
or they'll say Mandarin is hard, but I understand English. Okay, so you think Mandarin is hard because actually at the beginning, there's so many characters, there's so many things that seem foreign to you that it seems like a lot of work. But if you actually stick with Mandarin, what you'll find is that the Mandarin languages um, tend to get quite, it becomes quite easy to produce a large number of sentences once you've mastered a smaller set of vocabulary and structures because, um, because of the ideological way the language has been structured. English, however, people are like, oh, it's so easy because I don't have to learn all these conjugations like I would in Spanish, French, Portuguese, Italian, whatever. And I also don't have characters to write. And, you know, the sounds are incredibly hard. So English is easy. OK, but then you look after. I don't know, three months of study, after three years of study, after 30 years of study, do you understand the complexities of of phrasal verbs <laughs> you know what if someone says show there's the verb show right and then there's show out do you know what show out means what about show up right, if i show you something i'm demonstrating something if i show out then maybe i'm like um showing bad behavior or maybe i'm showing bad behavior but i'm winning like i'm doing it great um if I'm showing up, then I'm at a place where, you know, maybe an event was planned to happen. If I, um, you, you see what I mean? Language is complex and there's so many levels of what, like, on what level are you understanding something? Um, yeah, it's so much more complex. We want to say we understand. We love thinking that we got an idea that we just get it, but we're understanding on a gradient. We're understanding um in proportions so i understanding that i'm usually not willing to take the violence of thinking that someone has understood me because i chose a word that they thought they could relate to more because really all that i feel that i've done is comfort them and help them feel that we're closer um, than we actually are in our experience so i'm responding to um this thought a little bit, and if you want me to speak more directly. Um, so you have two points. You can understand what I just shared, and like, I really don't think that anyone is getting closer to understanding your experience in a meaningful way if, um, if you are reducing it in that fashion. And also, there's others like myself who that violence of like if, if the word if we're using the word gay for example then reintroducing that word back into the space where i also exist and where gay cannot legitimately or sincerely refer to my experience is really violent for me um that word does not affirm my existence in any meaningful way so there's that secondly um at the same time Emo saving emotional labor is critical and understanding when people are not prepared to use your resources wisely. First of all, to understand that people are stealing resources historically. And sometimes it's so, so historical and it's so um, embedded. They do it so well that they won't realize that you may not realize and that you calling it out will make you look like, like, like a jerk or an idiot or like you are just unreasonable or insane. I'm using all these words critically again. Um, so no, I totally get that. I think that we should be using um, strategies to preserve our emotional labor and resources and our mental and physical and spiritual and everything. We should be doing that. Um, and I think that there are probably strategies to save your emotional labor while also um, using things that don't, that are not so far. I don't know if you feel it so far. Um, for me, it's incredibly far from my own experience, but maybe using something that you feel is closer to your experience and doesn't cause as many violences and actually does facilitate deeper understanding um, while also saving your emotional labor. 
that's a hard thing to figure out, but um, my personal choice, I'm not saying this is politically best, but my personal choice is that I will usually um, do the thing that most affirms me and most aligns with my truths and resonates with me, even if that means that every time I say the word, people are like, what? Um, I'd rather have that experience and know that I know my truths than to hear sounds and truths that are dishonest resonated back into my surroundings and then be applied to my body. I'm not really, um, I'm not willing to do the extra work of having to hear it twice. So those are um, my thoughts on the article and to bring in some questions of gender, sexuality, and language as we look at different social changes that are happening. And if you have some um, questions that you'd like me to look at right now, please send them immediately. I'm going to take just about one more minute and then close the space um, if we don't have any more questions. I'm going to eat some pineapple real fast. Mmm, I'm hungry. Hunger, hungry. Hungry, hungry hippo, that's me. Mmm. I'll make sure to do more disgusting things on cam also, just like, because I'm sure everybody loves hearing and watching me eat. Okay, so yeah, if there are no more questions, then I guess we'll close the space. And as always, I just want to say thank you for everyone who um, is watching and engaging. I'm praying that this video will not be removed, will not disappear. I'm going to try to save it so at least I can re-upload it if that happens. I don't know why, but this is part two, and there's part one of the video, which is separate. So... Um, even if you're just tuning in now, you can go back and watch both sections and um, engage some of these questions. And if the live videos stay up, as I'm hoping that they will, then we can continue to use this space as um, a place for reflection. And I'll continue to welcome questions and share my thoughts as I can. And yeah, I also am going to post my link to the YouTube channel for Intuit Hue, which is where I also, or more traditionally, talk about things like this and share experience. Um, I'm putting videos there and different healing and spiritual and artistic resources. So I'm going to share that. If you can subscribe, um, please do so and share with others who could also benefit from it. But um, yeah, I think that's all. And thank you so much for engaging me. Uh, who knows what else I'm going to do? I might do a cooking something, like make some food some plant-based food and share that with you all. But either way, thanks so much for joining. And if you're in a similar time zone, then hope you have a great night. And either way, I hope you're having a great time wherever you are. And I'll talk with you soon. All right, take care.